Hey guys, does Slitter Magic here, and it's time for chapter 5 of the Rivals of Ixland storyline. There are only 6 chapters, so this is the second to last. This one is entitled, Who Tells the Stories? And of course the answer to that is, The Warrior Poet. Thanks for watching, I'll see you guys next video. Okay, fine, I'll actually read it. So we're starting with the first subsection, titled, Hwatli. Of course, because every chapter is just the person's name instead of something creative. Eh, we're jumping to this person now. Deal with it. What do you want me to do? Name it? So this chapter starts out right when the immortal sun just vanishes. Remember, all the different factions are, like, fighting, and they're all seeing who can, like, step on it. They're using massive magic on each other. And then all of a sudden, it just disappears. Tezzeret opens a portal, grabs it, it's gone. So that's disappointing. So you might recall they were all, I guess, standing on it. That's actually a bit of a stretch. It isn't exactly what they were doing. But um, when it disappeared, it said they all fell through the floor into the empty chamber below. So everyone's like shocked and slightly injured from the fall. And the first person to get up and say something is ya boy Angrath. He is my favorite character and he is basically me in Minotaur form. So he starts laughing, he glares at every single person in the room, and yells at the top of his lungs, I hate this plane, I hate this city, and I wish you all a viscerally painful death. His body glowed a warm and vivid orange, and he called out, See you never, pathetic fools, as he planes walked away. Oh, is there even a reason to keep reading? That is the greatest thing I've ever read in a lore story ever. Angrath is awesome. I hope we see him again. He should have called it a backwater crap plane, dropped a microphone, flipped him off with both hands, and then said peace out. That would have made it even more perfect, but uh, since that's not quite realistic, I'll stick with this. That was the funniest damn thing. I love it. I'm sure the SJW lefty idiots who wrote this story were like, he's the perfect example of toxic masculinity and what happens when testosterone and blah, 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 blah. Whoopsies, he accidentally made the most awesome character ever. And so everybody else is like, what did he just do? Because um, they don't really know what planeswalking is, because why would they? So Vona gets super pissy. She's like, no, which one of you took it? Where did it go? Which one of you douchebags with your Mexican Aztec taco magic took it? That's right. That's a direct quote from the story for sure. Yeah, I know. It's ironic. The Spanish are saying anyway. Oh, um, by the way, when they said that everybody fell through the hole or that's just what I filled in the gap with. Uh, no, Malcolm and Breaches are still up above um, as well as Maverin Fane. And so they're all talking to each other and they're just they're just like done fighting and they're just like, where'd it go? Seriously, it, it's just gone. Hey, remember everybody's favorite little blue monkey pirate, Breaches? He just goes, where is Sun? And uh, Tishana yells at him, it's gone, goblin. And then Malcolm says, what do we do now? And Breaches says, run away? <laughs> you know, Breaches is kind of like the anti-Angrath, but like he's still totally awesome. So I guess they just jumped aboard the flying siren guy and they just bailed out the window, which is uh, kind of hilarious in itself. Oh, and as the siren slowly flew away, everybody else just heard the fading sound of... Okay, see if you can make heads or tails of this. Tishana waved her hand and Huatli heard a thud followed by a pained groan from the room above. Moments later, Maverin Fane clambered through the hole in the ceiling and moved to Vona's side. I think in the last chapter, Tishana had used some kind of vine growth spell to like stick Maverin Fane to the wall. So they're all basically just chilling, and then they see a shadow appear in the, like, crack in the door that, uh, Jace, you know, he had unlocked it and opened the door. And, uh, it's St. Elenda, and she walks in and says, Is it gone, children of the night? Oh, you already know what I'm gonna do next. The second she walked in, all they heard was... We are the children of the night, and fight for the future of foundation. That's right, Elendra's magic is so powerful that anytime she walks through a door into a room with people in it, it just automatically plays her intro music from WWE, I guess. That, that's kind of weak intro music, like old school 80s happy hardcore, but whatever. By the way, whenever I'm sorting cards, 100% just like four hour happy hardcore and nightcore mixes. It helps you keep your sanity while also slowly chipping away at it. I have transcended to the top levels of happy hardcore at this point. I have discovered that there are at least three different happy hardcore Oompa Loompa Willy Wonka remixes. 
So Vona and Manfred were like, oh my god, it's Alindra. And then uh, Tashana's just like, eh, we probably got to fight her. And Huatli's like, hey, I know who that is. Also, her name's not Alindra, it's Alinda. And I've been saying it wrong for like two minutes. Actually, they're the ones saying it wrong. It would be Santa Alinda. So Alinda's just like, okay, y'all screwed this up. Uh, did the same beast that swooped down and took it before take it again? That was, of course, Azor, by the way. So they're like, I don't know who you're talking about, because remember, they never knew about Azor and didn't meet him. He already flew away before the, you know, thing disappeared and they all fell through the hole. So Land is like, hey, on the way in, I saw something big and blue fly away. It looked awfully familiar. And they're just like, I don't know what you're talking about. So they're just like, okay, it literally just vanished from underneath us. We don't know what you're talking about. And then St. Elena just like thinks for a second. She's like, so it's gone for good. Why are you asking them? They don't know what the hell happened. Unless she was just making a statement. I mean, nobody there's like, oh, yeah, it must have been Tezzeret. They don't know what the hell happened. So she literally was just like, well, I guess it's gone for good. And then starts walking back out the door, just like super casual. But the man from Fane's like, hold up. We got to go after it. And then she goes, shh. No, mijo, it is gone forever. We are free. Do you not feel the change in la ciudad? I legitimately don't remember if that means country or city. My Spanish is terrible. In context, I think they would actually use the word pueblo. And she's like, no, 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 no entiendas. The power that was bound here is free now. Oraska's magic was subsumed. What the hell does subsumed mean? But anyway, it was subsumed so long as the immortal sun was here. Now it flows as freely as my namesake. Which you may recall she would not possibly know about because she's been asleep and unaware of anything that happened the last couple hundred years. Um, apparently Vona thinks it's equally BS because it says she rose from her kneeling position as though the floor had suddenly caught fire. Uh, in the blink of an eye, she closed the distance between herself and Elena and began to shriek, which is odd because she doesn't have haste. And she says, how long? How long? How long have you been here? How long? How long? I'm not kidding. I read that completely verbatim. And then it's not really an answer, but Elena says, uh, my journey ended centuries ago when I found this place. Okay, I think... Vona meant how long have you been like awake for or returned? I, I don't know. None of them are asking or answering the right questions. So I don't remember Elena's alleged history, like what they all believed about her, but it doesn't really make sense. But Vona says, why? Why have you betrayed our people? Why have you denied us true immortality? Um, wasn't Elena like looking for the immortal son or I, I don't remember. I thought she became a vampire to look for it, but she replies, finding true immortality was never our purpose, Miha. You know, they're not actually related and she's not a child, but we're going to go with it. So she, she just kind of reminds him, we were supposed to guard the immortal son, not use it. So yeah. So the whole dark power vampire thing that we all took into ourselves, um, and all the horrors that it's wrought, it was just supposed to let us find the immortal son, just become stronger and more combat capable so we could find it and protect it. You know, like against Pedro and the Wicked, which I do believe was the uh, Aztec dude who tried to use it, or did actually use it. He caused a lot of destruction from what I heard. Probably went all Jurassic Park Lost World up in there and just had a big old rampage. So apparently, even though, like, I'm pretty sure it said Elena was, like, sleeping in a temple pretty far outside of Raska, it either was inside Raska and it was just kind of misleading, or it was really close to Raska, like, within the confusion protection field like the anti-navigation magic which if you recall works like crap but um she says hey when i found this place so she actually found it she found the immortal son and found raska all on her own <laughs> refer to my last comment she said you know what this is a good place to guard it um it'll do a better job of protecting it than we have and if it ever like if the city awakens and the immortal son awakens or whatever then i'll wake up and go wreck some people I mean, it makes sense. Clever plan, I guess, you know, but now she's like totally shaming the other vampires who think she's a saint. And so naturally, Vona replies, that's not true. It can't be true. And of course, Elena says, search your feelings. Vona, I am your father. You know it to be true. <laughs> hey, you rip off lines from other movies. I'm going to make fun of it. So they go on and on arguing back and forth and Vona's trying to say they did nothing wrong, whatever. And then all of a sudden, Huatli just goes, hey, St. Elena, can you please return to Torazan and leave Ixalan in peace? Your people did not understand what you meant for them to learn and they mutilated your memory in your absence. You must be the one to tell your story, not them. In other words, tell them to leave. 
Oh, and then we get a little bit of maybe foreshadowing. This could just be like flowery writing, whatever. But um, Elena walks up to Watley and she's like, hey, you are wise, Watley, warrior poet. How the hell did you know that? Um, and your future will be one of service to worlds far beyond our own. Blessed is your path. So kind of means we might see Watley again. I mean, she is a non-white female planeswalker who has a ton of lore and story behind her. So... From just a Wizards of the Coast standpoint, yeah, I think we're going to see her again. Although her magic is almost exclusively summon dinosaurs. Tame dinosaurs, ride dinosaurs. So that's a little narrow. Maybe she could summon a horde of squirrels to form up into a swarm of one giant, well, I was going to say squirrel, but dinosaur shape, and then she could ride the squirrels. I don't even care what card that is or what mechanic. I would play the hell out of it. So Vona is still pissed because Elena tells um, Avern Fane, hey, take me to Queen Meralda, who apparently is the Taurus own queen. And Vona says, take yourself. You're no saint. And then she slices her across the cheek with like her claws or weapon. Or, I don't know. Didn't really say. Oh, wait, no. Mavrin was the one who sliced her across the face. Nice. So she tells her, do not speak ill of a living saint. And of course, Vona replies, I'll speak ill of whoever I please whomever that would be actually if you're referring to multiple people and so maverin's like not having any of this he just goes off on her he's like i will pull out this smartphone right now i got the papa john's app i will summon papa john himself i will order like 16 pizzas extra garlic sauce i'm not just gonna put it on the breadsticks i'm dumping it on the pizza and i will force feed it to you until your headlights on fire but you know garlic and vampires if you don't respect Elena, you pera. Sera su boca ahora, which I do not think is the correct command form of that. Necesito aprender más español. Okay, what actually happened is Elena's like, mm -mm, snaps her fingers, boom. Vona just like goes face first into the ground and like can't get up. Like 10,000 pound weight on her face. So then Elena's like, you will take me to Queen Meralda and then lets her up. And so they just, without saying a word, just all three walk out the door. You know how they said in chapter six, it would be exclusively revealed who controls Araska? First of all, who cares? The immortal son is gone. Secondly, the characters say who cares? And two of the groups have already left. Like they, they did not say that this would be revealed on uh, February 7th is the date stamp on this chapter. That seems odd. I don't think that's correct. But yeah, they distinctly said chapter six. I'm like 94% sure of it. So how the vampires would like come back and control it later if they already left, it seems like it's just some kind of shoehorned in BS anyway, and none of this meant anything. And since we were getting massive thousands of negative miles on the geocaching thing and the voting method was easy to duplicate and just, I personally voted about seven times on the poll. I'm gonna say it's not as important as they're kind of playing it up to be. So Huatli and Tishana are talking. They're just like, okay, now what do we do? <laughs> and uh, I don't know. Merfolk lady says, well, there, I mean, there's still some old magic in the walls of Raska, uh, you know, because the Sen Empire built it with like power and I don't know. She's just trying to make her feel better. Boy, this whole thing's going down the crapper in a hurry. <laughs> Araska belongs to no one, Watley said. The Sun Empire's claim is old, but does not reflect the realities of ownership. It should be shared. Okay, that's not what the poll said. So Watley's like, yeah, I really do think that it should be shared. Um, I'm going to return to Pachatupa, or wherever the hell she lives, and advise the Emperor, who, by the way, if you recall, had a giant army standing outside Araska. I guess that went nowhere. And Tishana replies, you know how it was a really big hole that you guys fell through in the ceiling? It pales in comparison to the plot holes in this storyline. So they just say they'll negotiate it later. If you guys are willing to negotiate, Tishana says yes. And they're going to come to a peaceful agreement and co-own it and the rest of the people left because they're not interested. So the Sun Empire and the vampires win, I guess. I don't know. They're, they're probably going to U-turn this pretty hard in chapter six. So Huatli touches the wall on her way out to see if uh, Araska's power is still, well, capable of doing a little trick. And it's revealed that she basically summons and controls, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, Zakama, the Primal Calamity, the three-headed T-Rex. So she like literally rides it back and then she's like, oh crap, how do I even dismount this thing? This is really high up. So the Emperor sees her uh, dismount the, the dinosaur, not so gracefully, it says, even though he like lowered his head down because she told him to. Uh, he, he's like, okay, there's a giant, like hundred foot, three headed dinosaur stomping off. I take it. You found Araska. 
Okay, why did him and the army return home? Did the, did the authors actually just forget that he had an army that was marching towards Raska? I distinctly remember reading that. So, like, all of her extended cousins, family, Inti, whoever the hell that is, I think it's her cousin or something, they all, like, hug her and, oh, they agreed. Uh, and then, of course, um, Inti says, well, you came back on a three-headed dinosaur, an elder dinosaur, somehow they know what that is. He better give you the title of warrior poet. Don't leave until that helmet is on your head, warrior poet. And then it says, Huali's gut dropped. She had forgotten about her title. Really? Because I'm pretty sure Elena just called you warrior poet, like, 10 minutes ago. So she meets with the emperor and he's got the helmet on a table. He's like, Hey, it's yours. We'll have a, a ceremony tomorrow and everything. And she starts to kind of second guess it. Cause she's like, you know, if I could allegedly travel to other worlds, like that crappy snow place we went to um, for like one second, by the way, with Angrath, uh, what more do I really have to gain from earning something as small as a title? So they sat down and she told him everything, like straight up, like they were working with the merfolk, they followed the vampires, what they did, and then she told about Angrath and how he was from another world and how you can travel to other worlds and St. Elaine does back and just the whole shebang. And so then she ends with, hey, um, the immortal sun's gone, by the way. Uh, and Araska isn't technically ours because I agreed to share it or whatever. I'm sure that'll go over real well. So the emperor um, thinks about everything she said and then eventually says, that is not the story I want you to tell tomorrow. So just like the complete jackass that he is, he says, we are weeks away from invading Fort Adanto in the south, which is, of course, the conquistador vampire place. Um, I need the message of tomorrow to be one of inspiration and conquest. Araska is ours and our people see the dinosaur you arrived on and hear a story about working alongside the River Heralds, I won't have the support I need for our military campaign. Yeah, because peace with the Merfolk and a powerful ally really doesn't go hand in hand with defeating the vampires. No, not at all. Also, the Merfolk, it's well known that they want the vampires to leave the continent too. And Watley's pissed. So she says, after what I told you, you still think that, you know, that's the most important thing is like killing vampires. So he reminds her, hey, you said that Maverin Fane and the Butcher of Magan, Vona, were monsters. And she, of course, says, well, monsters who were severely reprimanded by their own deity, Fort Adanto will be empty when we arrive. The church will want Elena returned immediately. Which is probably true, actually. There really is absolutely no reason for them to even be on the continent of Ixlan anymore, so they're probably all headed back to, uh, I'll just say, Spain. And Emperor Idiota says, um, oh, well, then it'll be easier for us to reclaim. You march an army down there, you walk in the door and go, we won! What the hell? So he finally just says, okay, fine, you can have the crappy helmet, but I'm going to give the oration, and I'm going to tell whatever story I want to the people of Raska, and you ain't going to say nothing. So then, of course, she says, oh, no, you don't. It is the right of the warrior poet to address the public. I will not be silenced for the sake of your agenda. Honestly, if I were her, I would have killed him right then and there. Oh, I just made peace and you want to make war? Yeah, you're dead. You're the worst leader ever. Bye-bye. So she's like, nope, that's what I'm doing. You shut up and he leaves. And so it says she returned to her family and they were full of praise and congratulations and somehow had already cooked, quote, rabbit and frillhorn tamales and four kinds of sauces. That sounds delicious. I'm actually kind of hungry right now. Um, I think I'm going to go to the Mexican place down the street and see if they have that. Okay, okay. You know I got to roll the clip. I made you tamales. Mama Marquez's famous tamales? With just a pinch of cinnamon. Wait a damn minute. Cinnamon. By the way, that's the secret. Everybody got to put a pinch of cinnamon in the ground beef. So anyway, Huali started, you know, answering all the questions from her family and like told them all about how planeswalking works and stuff. And they're just like, dude, that's crazy. And one of them just straight up says, oh, well, you can't stay here then and just be the emperor's pet. You have to go like wherever, Huali. Wow, the level of respect they have for their emperor is very telling. So she's like, oh, but I'm the warrior poet. I meant to stay here. And they're all just like, nah, man, you got to go like get some stories from elsewhere and stuff. As if her family would really say that. So Huatli finally is like, okay, everybody's in agreement. Fine. I'll go for a week. Literally, that's what she says. I'll go for a week. She's going to go on a one week planeswalking vacation. <laughs> what the hell? Dude, this family in this story is so my Mexican friend's family, all right? Her aunt leaps to her feet and says, I'll pack for you. And her cousin Inti started stuffing tamales into a bag. Or pardon me, tamales. And says, you'll need rations. 
And everybody knows that tamale rations are el mejor rations. And so Huatli reminds him, okay, but I'm coming back after a week. Like, don't even worry about it. But everybody's just running around prepping for her trip. And she's probably got a whole damn, like, prepper's kit ready to go. By the way, watch the other video on my channel about the prepper's kit that I got. Like the, uh, the what do they call it? A go bag, a emergency bag, a, uh, um, oh yeah, bug out bag. That's what everybody calls it. Not gonna lie, mine's pretty badass, pretty effective, and pretty cheap. And if you don't have, like, just a basic emergency bag for, like, oh crap, we gotta leave the house. Oh cool, everything's all set in a bag for me already. Yeah, you might want to consider building that. Like, you don't have to be a prepper to be, like, some kind of natural disaster could hit. I've had buildings completely leveled by tornadoes, okay? So, I've been through more than a couple tornadoes. This is Wisconsin. So then it says, uh, Huali hugged and kissed her family and was told to stay put for a second while her family snuck into the Temple of the Burning Sun to retrieve the helm of the warrior poet. Let me back up a couple paragraphs. Okay, yeah, I made a slight mistake there because I said she took it with her on the way out of the Emperor's place. Uh, no. I kind of misread look as took. So she actually left the next morning before the ceremony even happened. So she just, like, wanted the helmet, I guess? Or they just, like, felt like she should have it because she earned it? And since she can't talk at the ceremony anyway, they're just like, let's just steal it. Seems reasonable. Oh, and when they got back from stealing the helmet, Inti was wearing it, by the way. This honestly sounds like something my group of friends would do. If you had, like, alcohol and we karaoke, we basically got, like, a Friday night here, which I don't drink, it's just my friends do. I mean, I've tried my hardest, but we've never had a Friday night hanging out without going to steal an ancient helmet from somewhere. It's, it just, it happens every time. I've got an entire closet full of antique ancient helmets, and they may or may not be full of tamales. I mean, if we already stole the helmet and we just happen to be going past the Mercado, I mean, you know, I know how to pick locks, you know what I mean? We are going to get those 1 a.m. tamales. Andale, hombres, yo quiero tamales. So the whole chapter ends with her just saying goodbye to everybody, and she planes walks away to somewhere. Uh, it was very lightly implied that she was planes walking back to the plane that Angrath showed her, which, uh, for curiosity's sake, was actually a plane called Kaldheim. And it was also lightly implied that that's where Angrath was from. So since that's the only plane she knows how to get to, it's like, would she really go there? I mean, it's not like the Stargate network where you gotta, like, dial it ahead of time and then you just, woo, there. I mean, I think they have the sensation of flying through the blind eternities. At least that's what it, it's kind of said in this particular storyline. So maybe they're just, like, flying around. She's like, oh, that place looks cool. And then, like, floats towards it or something. And I don't know. I was gonna say, I don't know. I'm not a planeswalker. But according to Wizards, I am a planeswalker. All right, so, uh, this is wrapped up all tidy. Everybody left. The vampires left. The river heralds left. Nobody cares about Araska. What a great, fantastic, wonderful, and exciting setup for Chapter 6. So what do you guys think is going to happen on Chapter 6? I mean, I can almost guarantee there's going to be, like, a paragraph or two at the end about, oh, you know, Jace arrived on Dominaria, and he met up with the other planeswalkers, and, like, nothing of substance will happen. Not really. But it'll have, like, a teaser about Dominaria or whatever. Although, technically, I gotta say, the next set that comes out is the core set. So, will the core set have to do with Chandra going back to Kaladesh, which was somewhat implied that that's where she planeswalked to, Liliana going who knows where, Dominaria or uh, Innistrad, not sure. Um, I don't know if they really even said for sure where any of them went, but since it's all just little side stories and then we're going straight to Dominaria and they all meet up, will the core set have like a little mini sub story? Because I honestly don't think it'll have a story at all. I don't know if like M14 had a storyline. But if it does, I think it'll be kind of like Origins where it's like it, it's just, you know, five little miniature storylines or whatever. Maybe somebody will go talk to a Johnny. Maybe a Johnny will be in the core set. I don't know. So, I mean, leave your speculations down below. And most importantly, what do you think will happen in Chapter 6? Should be very interesting. I'm actually looking forward to it just based on solely the fact that we don't know anything about it. But the number one question on my mind is, like 20, 30 years ago, were British people really like, do you think Justin Hawkins is actually gay? <laughs> Really? Did Wham fly under your radar too? You still wondering about them, maybe? Anyway, I'll see you guys next story.